Welcome to Wine Road, the wine, when, and where of Northern Sonoma County. I'm your host, Marcy Gordon, with Beth Costa, Executive Director of the Wine Road. Thanks to Ron Rubin, we're able to keep our podcast rolling along. The financial support of River Road Family Vineyards and Winery allows us to keep recording, keep sipping wine, and keep sharing stories with our listeners. Check out their website at riverroadvineyards.com and explore their Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Old Vine Zinfandel from the Russian River Valley, as well as a finely crafted Cabernet Sauvignon from the Alexander Valley. That's riverroadvineyards.com. And hey, thanks, Ron, for allowing us to make this show happen. Welcome to episode 206. Today our guest is Leo Hansen of Leo Steen Wines in Healdsburg. And uh, welcome, first welcome, but we're drinking some amazing <laughs> bubbles. I've, I'm almost kind of got discombobulated here because this is so delicious. I know, it's a little distracting. I thought, oh, I'm bringing that bottle into the studio with us. Tell us a bit about <laughs> this. I'm going to need a, a refill This as is, the show goes on. This is sparkling Chenin Blanc. It is. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, this is actually our first uh, official release for sparkling wine from my brand, and I felt like it had to stay within the family, so it is Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc. A uh, quick note on it, it's a vineyard, own root of vineyard that was planted in 79 up on the Sacramento River. Oh, oh wow. So beautiful, sandy, well-drained soils and uh, lots of shade to the grapes. So perfect candidate for something picked for this maintaining acidity and green notes to uh, a base wine for sparkling. It, it is lovely. Oh my gosh, no kidding, understatement. So you said you're keeping it on the family of Chenin Blanc. That's really primarily what you're focused on? That has been the focus for my brand uh, since we started it back in 2004. Yeah. One of my very first wines I had, I, I kind of think of you as the Wizard of Chenin because <laughs> it, it's one of, you know, first of all, we don't grow a lot here. But I had a Shannon of yours from Jurassic Vineyard. Yes. And it's just, it is the most amazing. First of all, the soils in the vineyard there is very specific. It's very And unique. it creates yeah. such an amazing wine. But that Shannon Blanc, it's it's like imprinted in me. Yeah. It was, it was Where just is fabulous. Where is that vineyard? The vineyard is actually from my, uh, when I get on the freeway in Healdsburg on the 101, it's 350 miles to the exit. Uh, so flies uh, right by it's a long haul and I tell my wife every year oh, I don't think I want to deal with this that it's Santa Barbara County it's Santa, Barbara. Santa Ines Valley yes oh, yeah. so the soils down there as you mentioned it's uh, very sandy it's like a sandy beach with a lot of calcareous material limestone which is it's an difficult ancient sea to, floor yeah it's difficult to find in northern California you have to kind of get down from central and, and further south to find some of that. So it's also an own root of vineyard, planted in the early 80s. So, Which is very unusual. We started, we founded the brand around a vineyard uh, from the Saini family in the Dry Creek oh, back yeah. in 2006. So that that is where it started. But a few years after working with that, I added on this one. It was kind of a coincidence. Um, interesting enough, the Jurassic will ripen anywhere from three weeks to a month later than North Coast vineyards. Well, that's a lot. So really? yeah. within California, especially if I tell this uh, in Denmark where I'm from, uh, if you go south, it's actually cooler. It's a longer season. Uh, that doesn't make sense to most people. Um, but those valleys down there are more east-west. they Pacific influence. Yeah. The, the, the moisture and the, the cold influence from the Pacific is, has a much bigger impact down there. So up here, we are kind of protected by those mountain ranges and north to south running valleys, where down there is the opposite. So that makes for a cooler and a longer season and a slower and a more moderate. So typical, we will ripen Jurassic much later, but also at more moderate uh, mm -hmm. sugar levels. So it's a steadiness. Yeah. Typical, yeah. So then you have time to wrap things up and then make the 300-mile drive. <laughs> that is actually on a practical note. and uh, it, Works out perfect. It actually works out because we all know in our business, if you if you grow and you work with vineyards all in the same sort of fashion of ripening, yeah, you're going to... Can't keep up. No, can't manage that. It's can, hard. You can't turn the tanks or whatever your, your story is. So right. that's, that's a, a problem. So I want to ask about this label also. Tell me about the, the label on this little sparkling gem. So it's, a, um, it's an artist out of New York. Her name is um, Antoinette, and uh, she has a gallery in Manhattan. Um, she did spend some time in Sonoma County, and that was sort of the connection. She I was did, wondering how would yeah. you connect there. And 
another producer I make a little bit of wine for, a very small producer, uh, introduced me to her and she had used some of her artwork. And so we asked if we could. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will have to say it took a long time. That does, we, we spend a lot of time focusing in on some of her pieces of art to do like a, a just a part of it to the whole piece of artwork. So there it, it was a, a probably a year oh of, of on and off to try and figure something out with her. So. Anyways, we are happy with the result of the wine and the package. So. Yes, it's a great synergy between the, the look and the taste and the flavors. Um, yeah, of course, that's the next natural progression, a sparkling of Chenin Blanc. Why not? It's wonderful. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it has to be at some point. <laughs> I feel like I've done everything else with Chenin from late harvest to fortified. and. But really, these yeah. days, people, sparkling is just so popular for every day. I mean, 20 years ago, people had sparkling on there. It was a toast when you got married, and I mean, it was it yeah. just was a whole different thing. I I have long been a big proponent of sparkling wine, and um, I think it pairs with so many things. I just think, to me, that's an everyday thing. It's not a special occasion. So I'm happy to see that. I like to hear that. Yeah, drink it every day. I, I <laughs> every try day. to. I try to. So the portfolio is kind of Shannon heavy, but then you also make, you make a Cabernet, you make a Pinot. You Tell us about the portfolio. We do. So it did start a um, long time ago in the early 2000s when I was a sommelier for Dry Creek Kitchen when they were reasonably opened and running the wine program for them. Uh, that program was dedicated to grapes grown in Sonoma County. And it was a pretty extensive program. But as a buyer and trying to make the list interesting, uh, there was very few people bottling or making some of those interesting whites, right. let's just say varieties. Those right. those pieces of uh, property, they went to blends or were pulled out and planted into more Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay or what have you, other mm -hmm. more fashionable, higher dollar uh, varieties. So that was one reason that led me on the shiny train, if you will. So... Over the years, the brand has expanded with other things after we got tasting room and trying to build up a more DTC business. And so we do make a variety of stuff. Originally, you're in the same tasting room I think you shared with Heart's Desire. Correct. Yeah. Yes, because that's when I first met you and first drank, uh, tasted the wines. But you're still in that location, which is such a great spot. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's right in Healdsburg. Uh, if you were coming into Hillsburg and took the first Hillsburg Avenue exit, you crossed the bridge, Memorial Beach, and it's right there by the river. It is a great spot. There's yeah. other wineries there, so it's a nice little collective. You can you know park and go to several dis different spots. Old Roma Station, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, supposedly the Italians build that to be, make it a co-op for the uh, uh, production back in the 1860s. Oh, so, wow. I didn't so, know that. So it was meant to... So they made wine there up to... I believe, until Prohibition, and then that facility became uh, a place where they were drying prunes uh, when the prunes well, came into northern. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Right on the with the train depot, so it all made sense yeah. in some right. sense. Well, and it will again because there's a train depot. Yeah. Coming soon. Yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In Leo our lifetime. does not work for the Chamber of Commerce, apparently. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the philosophy of the tasting room and what happens when people come. Do you have set tastings or what's the vibe going on that you're putting out? On a normal basis, so we just open the weekends and appointment do, during the week. Uh, we do have uh, tasting, you know, uh, our own tasting lineup, but we do try and, and attract a lot of other things. So we've done some, recently I've just done a few events with the former chef Matteo. I used to work with the director kids uh, and yeah. we did some pairings with him. We do other events like uh, music or food trucks and other barbecues and, and to try and draw some people in and show off the place. Uh, on top of it, we do have, we also rented out to uh, as an event space like rehearsal dinners and other things oh, really? like, like more it is a big space yeah it's, and not necessarily a sit down you know, more like a casual setting right. so we do have s stuff like that going right. on as well but I noticed cool when spot. I come by it's always popping over there <laughs> so you it, you are just open weekends now is that what you said Friday to Sunday is our okay. normal schedule yeah okay yeah. And but you don't have to have a reservation people just show up they can we prefer we like to see reservations so we know what to plan for but but you don't have to, no. Right. We do organs. Yeah. Yeah. So 
what really led you down the path of starting this winery? I mean, I would say it was never really meant to be in the way that That's so many uh, what people say. Uh, <laughs> it yeah, was I know. Accident. I think a lot of people they, One thing they led don't to have another. a plan really, but uh, well, it sounds like you saw a need. You know, as a sommelier, you saw yeah. these uh, different grape varieties that you weren't seeing a lot of, and maybe you saw a little opening and a niche to fill. That's how it started, and I also back then had a day job at a winery in Alexander Valley. Uh, Stu Miller Vineyards. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was there for many years, and uh, I did make my wine on their facility back in the day. And again, it was sort of a coincidence I landed there. I came to Hillsburg in the late 90s just to work harvest and be here for three months hmm. and kind of forgot to take my flight back. <laughs> I was so, going to say that. It's been a while. I was saying you, you missed your flight. Yeah. I lost my ticket back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one thing leads to another, and that's sort of life. And, uh, is this well, a learn as you go? Or yeah. did you go to Davis? Or did No, you... I don't have any formal. Yeah. No, it's been learned by doing that. And talking really? to other winemakers yeah. and working in other wineries. And... That, and yeah. I did work with a uh, consultant winemaker in the first few years, uh, Kerry Damsky. Oh, and yeah. And I learned a lot from Kerry. And... Uh, very great person to to work with. He's Both. got such great energy. I just, love him. Not just the energy, but yeah, also obviously his knowledge. And, well, and no everything. kidding. So, so obviously that was a fortune for me. Um, and then just kind of learn by doing. And uh, at Stumula, you know, we just I was there. We were growing that brand significantly throughout the years. I think I was there for sixteen years. Mm-hmm. So, and on the side, slowly building mine up, but my brand. But that was never really the intent, honestly. It was to try and make some dry shiny, find some old vineyards that was a lot of, you know, they have a long history in California. Yeah. And I felt like they weren't utilized to the potential they probably should at right. the time. And now there's a definitely a renaissance in that. Like people are planting. Yes. On, Just even become right a here resurgence. where we're sitting out here in West County, they're planting on better sites and in Napa and well, I mean the climate so. is changing, and I think also people are. I mean, you, they're the world of wine is beyond Sonoma County. There's Chardonnay and there's Pinot and there's Infantil and there's Cab. So, I mean, everybody wants something different. Yeah, and I think more and more so people are yes. minded to that for sure. And younger generations, they definitely want want other things different. Uh, that generation needs to uh, start drinking wine. I think that's a whole yeah. lot of story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think they drink wine, but they particular about it. And they don't drink what their parents are drinking, for no. sure. But isn't that a learning curve, I feel? Yeah. Did, did you drink what your parents were drinking? Oh, God, no. No, so there But, I go. mean, they were much older. <laughs> they were drinking Gallo Hardy Burgundy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where is the Peaberry Vineyard? Where is so that? So the Peaberry is just a, a name we attach to it. It is actually a... Ranch is called Sterling. It's on the old river road up in southeast Ukiah. So oh, oh, okay. So it's north of, yeah. Kind of a north-facing gentle slope of a vineyard up there that uh, was owned by a gentleman, Tim Nergard, for many years. And he ended up selling it about four or five years ago. But I worked with that vineyard since 2016. So there is a great, I what I love about your Shenans is they are very different. They're you very know, different. And, well, I, and well, it's completely different regions, but it, yeah. But it, re, it really shows, and it the shows sites, the grape site is everything. Well, very, they're very different, but on top of that, the winemaking are very different. Um, they, again, there's some practical in that, but there's also just to try and and show the, the site in a different way. I didn't feel at the time that the market necessarily was ready for me to come out with, let's say, three identical made shinies. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of Pinot producers, to take an example of other producers, will make five different Pinots. They are almost identical with right. the winemaking and the oak right. regime, what have you. And the nuances are smaller because of the site. Here they are significantly different. The pea berry we are often are using some skin contact. There's no sulfur use necessary. Uh, it's definitely not a filtered wine. So picked earlier, I feel like that site really shows well at at uh, typical low alcohol. and mm-hmm. So it's typical maybe 11% alcohol at uh, sort of more salty and nervy and full of energy, different style. So that's been – and the, the name is taken from the coffee industry, pea berry. I mean, oh, these okay. are, these the are very yes, – they're, they're exactly. teeny. For some reason, I remember asking the grower, 
why what they were so grapes? small. <laughs> and he, he was just like, oh, I got, he got the botwood from a neighbor back in the mid 70s and planted some shinny and doesn't really have any records of that. So, <laughs> and, and that's not, re- yeah. So they are significantly smaller than uh, the clusters fit in my hand. They, so, oh my Lord. where in Saini and Sonoma and down in Dry Creek, those are more traditional big yes. bunches yeah. that produces a. So interesting because they, they are so distinct, yep. the, the three different Shannons. And then this one, where does this fall? I mean, I would say the sparkling there is its own entity in terms of uh, a whole nother add to the lineup of style and. It is meant to be, it is dry, you know, yeah. there's no dechasse in it. And the aging on the leaves uh, in the bottle is shorter than you would typical a, a most most sparkling wines. Right. So I want to just keep it fresh and crisp and, and lively that it's way. fabulous. I'm going to try it just a little more to make sure. So you can kind of do a little <laughs> mini master class of Shannon if you taste through the three, four wines. It There's is interesting to, to see. I, I feel like you can see a lot by looking at, obviously, in the vineyard, but also when you're looking at a cluster, what, what is that potentially going to bring you? You look at, for most people, I see the difference between a Sinfidel and a Pinot cluster. Something oh, yeah. small and delicate, mm-hmm. something big and right. and brambly. I remember I used to do that for, for the serve staff when I was to saw me at Direct Creek Kitchen. I'll bring in at harvest a variety of clusters. Oh, people great. love that. And kind of talk about, okay, look at the cap on the cluster. They're, these small thick skin berries that will naturally give you potentially this style of wine and so forth. But if we line the shinny clusters up that I work with, it's very interesting to see because they are all in their own universe of shinny. I think that's, that is surprising. So they're all for, they're all old vineyards for California standards, that is, which is also, as generally speaking, an important factor to me when we work with the relationship with different growers. It is a very vigorous plant that in its youth can just be more neutral and produce. They just want to produce a a massive yield unless uh, you can tame that. Right. Interesting. How it's managed. How it's managed. Yeah. So so growing up in Denmark, do you come from a background of food and wine or what was the genesis for? My parents were in the restaurant industry where I, in the earlier years, started helping my dad. And yeah. And then later on, I went the serving the wine side mm. of it and mm-hmm. took my Somi exam back in 97. Oh. Yeah. And then accidentally became a winemaker <laughs> and I, accidentally opened a winery. <laughs> and again, that was never in the cards, let me tell you. Uh, no. <laughs> like people say, if I only knew how much I was involved, when I, I would never have gotten into it. But sometimes it's good <laughs> yeah. to go in yeah. not knowing too much. <laughs> right. Probably a good idea, yeah. Well, it's... Um, but it sounds like the one thing that I talk about, our last guest, the last show that we did, we talked about the collaboration between winemakers and vineyard managers is what keeps the, really the industry going. It sounds like you've benefited from that, just from having you know, the right mentors to help you along the way and to answer questions. And For sure. Absolutely. Know. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. 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 Just, I haven't heard Kerry Damsky's name in a long time. I love him. <laughs> I, I think it is still a small community that way uh-huh. that, yeah, people, you know, are open to... Helping. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's the whole idea. It's time for our Fast Five. Who do we have on the line now? Hey, this is Mark. Mark, from where? From Sonoma Couture Vineyard. Oh, oh that's Mark. Mark. Yay. Okay. What's, Thanks for calling you in. You forgot awesome. me already. I know. <laughs> Thanks what's, for what's calling your, in. <laughs> what's your fast five, Mark? Well, it's it's actually a cocktail. Yay, we like uh, that. Y- you know, I mean, I know, you know, we kind of talk a lot about wine uh, here, but uh, it's a cocktail. And it comes from a trip I was very fortunate to take a, a few years ago to Cuba. Mm. Oh, wow. That is uh, nice. Before they, you know, it was, it was shut, then it was open, then yeah. it was shut. Well, while it was open for that brief period of time, we we actually uh, were fortunate to take a trip down there for about three days, which was great. So while I was in Cuba, um, having a Cuban cigar, <laughs> of uh, course, well, as, yeah, you you know, right? as you do, as you do, I was trying to think of a, a, a you know of a, having a cocktail with it, and and the friend I was was with um, Bernie Hernandez, uh, he said, you know, what you should try, and I said, well, what's that, Bernie? And he said, rum and tonic. I said, really? I'm rum, such a rum drinker. Rum mm-hmm. and tonic. I said, I've never had a rum and tonic. So it's really simple. So you take uh, like white rum. White Bacardi, rum. Yes. White, white, white rum, rum. Bacardi, you know, in a regular cocktail glass. Mm-hmm. You put a 
you know, you know, uh, uh, a shot of that in there. Um, you put tonic in to with, of course, the ice. You know, you fill it with ice. Take a, a little wedge of lime, lime, squeeze the lime in it, drop the wedge of lime on top, and Bob's your uncle. It is, <laughs> it is so simple, and it is, and it is really a perfect summertime. I love it. Cocktail. <laughs> What's interesting is every, you know, it's kind of my go-to cocktail now when I go into a restaurant so and simple. I get a drink. Yeah. And I'll say, I'd like a rum and tonic. They're like, you want a gin and tonic? I go, no, I want rum. So I've never tried, well, I've never thought of that. specifically right. white rum. Right. Yeah. Now, I had somebody do, make it for me once using dark rum. Yeah. Does not work. It doesn't work do as well. Do yeah, it. it needs to be white rum. But but it's 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 perfect for like when you just want that, it's, and, and summer, summertime, well, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Beautiful summer cocktail, easy and very tasty. I love it. And so it's just called, do you have a special name for this? I call it rum and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> he had to sleep on that. Well, Let's see. I call I, it. And <laughs> we'll have to put all these ingredients in the show notes for you. But uh, yes, it, it's. I'm going to go test it tonight. The uncomplicated, complicated cocktail. I love it. Well, Mark, thank you so much. That is awesome. Thank You're you welcome. so much for calling. Talk Cheers. to you later. <laughs> Cheers. <Bye-bye. laughs> Okay, so if someone wants to come and taste your wines, they should call and make a reservation, but they don't have to. No, they don't. And you're they just right in Healdsburg, them. which is awesome. So they can, it's actually, you could walk from you. You could walk down to Longboard and yeah. walk over to the square. And I mean, I do have a lot of people who, who I talk to and they want to go out to the valleys one day and walk in the vineyards, but then they'd like a day to just park their car. and. It seems and like walk. that's, yeah, a lot of people coordinate the visits that way. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. you have a day of just walking around. I yeah. love it. And you have a great spot. Um, let's see. And then they should probably check your website for your event calendar for things you have going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you do have a great space. So if you do bring in food trucks and do that, I mean, that's you have the you space for do that. You can spend the day there. I mean, yeah, it's such there's a enough nice spot. Uh-huh. Yeah. It is a good spot. I'm disappointed that Davis family has moved, but they have, and I have no control over that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are too. They are great neighbors, uh, very sweet family. So. Yeah, yeah, that was. <laughs> that is a great spot, though. It, Riverside in it Hillsburg. Is. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to yeah, beat that it, spot. There aren't many places that are right on the river. Like no, that. I know it is definitely. No, I hope somebody will move in there pretty quickly. Yeah, I would think so. Okay, anything else that people need to know about your wines or what the experience will be if they come to visit you? I would say just come open-minded. Are you there most of the time, or is there someone else there? What's going to happen? We have if I somebody show up? else. Uh, if I can, I will pop in. Or I'll be working some, especially if we do events. I'll yeah. typically be there. But yeah. uh, I mean, that's usually the draw. I got to tell yeah. you. I mean, when I talk to people, I say if you come to our wineries, often you're going to meet the owner or the winemaker, and people think that's exciting for the events and stuff. <laughs> for the events you guys put on for the yeah. wine road, yeah. I will work them and yeah. I'll be there. But yeah. it depends. I have a lot of other travels and other things right so, yeah. right okie dokie okay so i do have one more thing <laughs> you I always, always have one more do thing. <laughs> i just want to before we wrap up i want to mention again if people haven't um checked out our website at wineroad.com you can check out how to become a wine road ambassador and really that's a program that we started because um we found that there's a lot of new people working in wineries who don't know a lot about the region. They're kind of new to the industry. So we thought it would be a great little tool for people working at the wineries to learn about the region and learn about the wine road and learn about how to help their guests. But in reality, uh, most of our ambassadors are people from all over the country. I have a lot of wine educators and a lot of psalms who've gone on become a little wine road ambassador. And if you go to our website, there's a study guide that takes you about 20 minutes to read. And there's a cute little video that has people representing each of the AVAs that we represent and people from Sonoma County Tourism. So the video is about 20 minutes long. And then there's a little quiz. It's multiple choice. You cannot fail. If you have (laughs) failed, there's a bigger problem. (laughs) So you really can't fail. And when you pass, because we know you will... (laughs) Then we send you this really cute little Wine Road Ambassador pin that you can wear with pride when you go wine tasting. And we really encourage people to do it. We have, I think, about 250 ambassadors now from all over the country. We have someone from Canada. We have someone from someplace in Europe. I mean, people are taking it. If you're going to come here for the first time and you want to know just a little bit about the whole region, uh, it's a great little thing to check out. So become a Wine Road Ambassador and we'll send you a little goodie. 
it's it's super cool. Well, we'll put a link to that Wine Road Ambassador Program in the show notes. We'll put a link to Leo's website so you can check out the wines and check out the events and make your plans to go visit. And uh, anything else? Best way to contact you is through the website? Yeah. Okay. That's email, yeah. Email, maybe even that old school phone thing, but no. <laughs> no call. Yeah, a so phone please don't that. call. Yeah. No, you can't. Yeah. It's so funny because people mention 20 different ways and then like, or you could just call. Yeah. <laughs> There's always that. People don't, it's, the phone has become like this weird thing where like, <laughs> no. don't call me. You know? Or people email me to say, can I call you? I'm like, no, you should have just called me. <laughs> and so the website is leosteenwines.com. Yes. Anything else? I think that's it. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you for bringing this beautiful sparkling. Yeah, thank you so much. I will take care of the rest of that. Don't you worry about it. (laughs) I'll give it a good home. (laughs) And we'll see you on the wine road. Okay. Bye. Thanks.